Welcome everyone to another VITA Learning Webinar featuring Peter Peasy. Uh, today's webinar is going to be Simplified Aesthetics to Advanced Ceramics, a Universal Ceramic System. Peter has done wonderful webinars in the past. We have a, a six week series uh, online that you can access and review. Uh, we have uh, many questions that are going to come through the um, the webinar. Uh, so those of you who do have questions, make sure that you use the uh, question box, type those questions in, and at the end of the webinar, we will answer those questions. Those of you who wish to have CE uh, credits, uh, at the end of the webinar, you'll get a an email from the education department and there'll be a couple links to click on and then you can go through the process to acquire your CE. Again, we do have recorded webinars. Uh, we're recording today's webinar as well, but you can visit uh, the VITA North American YouTube channel, the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can review those uh, series that Peter has done and other webinars that are also available that you can also acquire CE. So again, those of you who are um, looking for CE, you'll receive an email. We have everyone on mute. So if you have a question, please use your question box. So Peter, how are you doing today? All right, Mr. Jim, good to hear from your voice again and uh, trying to get organized. I'm actually in the lab today for a change. So that's kind of nice. We're opening up here in New York a little bit and uh, it's kind of nice to be here. Nice. That, that's good to hear. I, I hope everyone's starting to get back to work. Yeah, so, I hope so too. Um, I will leave it up to you, Peter, if you'd like to uh, move forward and, and start the webinar. Sure. Sounds great. Thanks, Jim. So welcome, everybody, and uh, nice to, to have some people out there. I appreciate you guys attending. So today's goal is really to talk about simplified aesthetics and to advance ceramics. And I want to kind of break that down for you a little bit. For me, whenever I start talking about ceramics in general, I really like to talk about it from a space point of view. And why this is important is because we're, we're used to hearing about the coloration of the ceramic or the amount of translucency in it. And those are all very important points for us. But even more so for me, it's really about space. What ceramic works best in the space that we're provided? And I think all of you would kind of raise your hand and say, I'm not getting enough space, or sometimes I might have too much space when I'm working on a Pontic. I know a few of you are saying, no, 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 we never have too much. Believe it or not, you do. There are times where you have both. You have doctors that are not preparing enough for many reasons, and that's no fault of the doctors, or possibly a little fault, depending on their concept of prep design. But also, I would throw us as technicians under the bus and say that I think we struggle at a time with understanding how to utilize the space. So first, when we talk about space, let's realize that some of the more challenging things that we're doing these days and why they're so much more challenging is because of the exact point I just made, is that we're working in either larger amounts of space, implants, pontic sites that are developed that give us more room to work in, or we're working in very minimally invasive areas, veneers, multi, um, micro layered substructures, and all of these present challenges for us aesthetically. So if we look at our patient, and I won't go into the diagnosis here really just for time because I wanna focus on the ceramic, but I think you can see the patient already had a restoration on the 2-1 or the number nine, uh, very unhappy with the aesthetics of their teeth. And again, I'm not gonna go into the whole diagnostic part of the case. I'll just tell you that originally when we started looking at this case, the concept was possibly six, eight, 10 units. And we did what we normally do, a normal diagnostic wax up to evaluate tooth position. And right away, we figured out that this functionally wouldn't match with the aesthetic parameters of what we were looking to do. Meaning that where we wanted the cuspids and the teeth to be, would have had to change who he was from a bite point of view or a clusal point of view. So right away, we opted to get away from that, that treatment plan. And we wound up just restoring the front four teeth. We're also going to restore um, the lower right lateral, the number 26, I believe that is. So that was the plan to restore the upper front four and then the, the lower number 26, which needed to be done. 
So let's first kind of touch on the spacing and understand what we did and, and why this is challenging for us. Obviously, we're doing some crown lengthening. We're going to get the tissue heights up on the on the seven and eight position, and then we're going to have the teeth prepped. Now, nine was already prepped, and number seven, eight, and ten were not. So these are going to become uh, more, let's say, slightly aggressive or slightly minimal. What do I mean by that? Well, look at number seven is full coverage. Number nine is full coverage, and they had to be because of the pre-existing restorations. And yet, number uh, eight and um, 10 are not. And we're gonna try to keep these as minimally invasive as possible. So these are gonna be veneers. Well, why is this a problem? Well, we wanna save tooth structure, so that's great. But also now look at the colorations that I have to work with. I have a lot of space in these areas with very dark prep shades, and I have very minimal space, but I'd say something decent prep shades. And this is why our understanding of the ceramic material becomes so critical for us, because these are the cases that I think we face more and more today than anything before. So the patient gets provisionalized, and I'm going to start working through the case. What I want you to realize is the full coverage on the number seven was about a 1.3 millimeter thickness. The veneer on the number eight was about a 0.5. The full coverage on the number nine was about a 1.2 full coverage. And then the veneer was a 0.6 on the lateral. So basically, I'm dealing with a lot of different space here. And why this becomes challenging is that not only is the space an issue, but the colorations of the teeth that are below it changes. And I fabricated some zirconia and some veneer restorations over the case. And then obviously, on the number 26, a uh, full coverage zirconia micro layered restoration managing the dark prep shades. And again, why is this important? Because in the end, this is our job, is to be able to work in all the different environments with all the different spaces and to understand okay. how our ceramic really works. So I won't give you the video on him because it's a long video and you don't need to see it. But I think the point of it is, this is what we deal with today more than ever before. So let's start from the basics in our short period of time together. For me, when I'm talking about the basic ceramic materials, I always look at things in what I would call a canvas. And the canvas is something that I've developed over the years from a teaching point of view about how ceramics should really work. And if you look at my canvas concept, it's basically three zones, which you're all probably very comfortable with. The, the gingival zone is where we usually have the highest amount of chroma. The middle zone or the middle third is where you're usually gonna see the most value in your restorations or your natural tooth. And then the incisal edge is really about either the age of the tooth or the effects that are involved in the tooth at that point. Now, what's interesting about these zones, if you look at it to the left of your screen, you're also going to notice that the zones seem to fall in line with the planes of the teeth. And as we understand form and contour, you understand how important the planes of each aspect of the tooth are. And also, even in prep design, how important the doctors have to understand the plane because that's what creates space for us to use. And I want you to be aware that when I teach the canvas concept, I'm teaching it from nature. It's not something I made out of, of midair. It's something that I've kind of worked on over the years based on looking at nature. Look at the gingival aspect of the nature and where you see the most translucency and chroma. Look at where the value pops up in that middle third of the tooth. And then the age of the tooth, depending on the age or the amount of wear, you're going to notice either some mammalons or more mammalons or no mammalons or different levels of translucency. And that is really more age specific to the patient. That's from a plane and a basic flat point of view. But now let's look at it from a depth point of view. Now, not only do I have to create my gingival coloration, my value areas, and my age and transition kind of a, a look towards the incisal edge, but now I have to work in the amount of space that I have. And in an ideal world, I think you should all be aware of that basic ceramic, the basic concept of all the ceramic materials you work with are very similar. What do I mean by that? Ceramic is built to work in 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters of space. That's where ceramic, as we know it, works best. 1.2 to 1.5. And so you're really clear what that really means is that normally the dentin is about one millimeter to eight tenths of a millimeter thick. And the enamel is usually two tenths of a millimeter to about five tenths of a millimeter thick. 
And this is very standard. And, and just so you're all clear, I spent a lot of time in, in ceramic factories, building ceramics and working through the colorations. And it's, it's an amazing process. I almost wish everybody can experience. At the same time, I want you to understand that it's probably as complicated as it's more simplified than some people realize. Our goal is to be able to take a dented material at eight tenths to a millimeter thick and put an enamel on it at two tenths to five tenths of a millimeter and have those two materials together make up the base shade that you're looking for, A1, 1M1, A3, whatever that coloration is. So when I tell you ceramics are made to work in that space, that's why I'm giving you that information. More space is not necessarily better. Less space is also much more challenging for us. And our job is to understand how to put that all together. So remember, when we look at nature, we're looking at the planes and we're looking at my canvas or the zones where I'd see the values and the chromas. Also, when I'm building this, I use this same concept for almost every case I do. So if I'm looking at a more youthful case, this is a uh, six veneers that I probably did 10 years ago already. Um, you'll notice that I have the chroma in, in the cervical. It gets a little bit brighter in that middle third. And then because they're youthful teeth, I have kind of a lot of translucency and, and some nice mammalons that are in there. And that's all built through my canvas. And if I change the value, you can see the differentials of what I talked about a little bit more. But I want you to know that I use this system for all kinds of teeth. So if you look to the left of your screen now, I have a very similar case built up, canvas concept again. The only difference is this is a much older looking tooth. So what did I really change? The density of the translucency, the density of the middle third value, and definitely the incisal edge where you don't have that crazy amount of translucency, you have more secondary dentin and warmer feel of a color. So even though these two restorations look fairly different, they're built very similar. The only thing that I'm really manipulating is which powder choices I'm using to give me either more density, more opacity, or more translucency. And that's why I kind of like to break down the ceramic systems for you a little bit so you have a better understanding of that. So first, let's be clear. When I talk about ceramics to me, everything is about optics, right? I know people tend to always be, always, always push the strength factors. And if you've taken any of my web series or you've heard me speak before, I'm not gonna say I'm anti-strength. I'm just not, for megapascal being 9 billion megapascals and thinking that makes our restoration better. What really makes your restoration better is choosing the right material for the right environment and understanding the optics of that material. And when I talk about optics, I'm not only talking about the ceramic material's aesthetic look, but I'm also talking about how the ceramic materials can manipulate light into the surrounding gingival architecture. Because part of what we need to do is not only manage the ceramic layering, but also manage how the light is transformed just like nature would do for us. So let's kind of go backwards a little bit more and break the ceramic materials down to start with. For me, I look at ceramics kind of like a chess game. I've always joked that I'm not a very good chess player um, and, and I hope some of you are. Maybe you could give me some lessons one day, but I do appreciate the game. I do appreciate the fact that each of these pieces that you're looking at have very specific roles they play. And some of those roles are much more useful than others, and some of them are kind of wasteful, right? So you can argue as a novice chess player that the pawn is really just something that helps set you up in a position. It's expendable, you don't use it all the time, but you use it just to help you get from spot to spot. Whereas if I go to a rock or a bishop or one of the other aspects, each of them have moves they can make that are more valuable because of the distance that they can travel. And obviously, women, you always win. And the queen is going to be the most valuable piece in the chess game for me. And I feel that way in life, and I feel that way in chess or, or with ceramics. Why? Most, about, most ability to do the most in the least amount meaning that the, the queen has the ability to travel all over the board. They can make, she can make any move she wants. She has the ability to be the, the most um, aggressive or the ability to be the most soft and sit back. And if I correlate this to ceramics, which is really where I'm going, 
for me, I look at my canvas as a chessboard, and all the pieces on it are my ceramic players. And it's my job to understand which one of them have the most value, which one have the most opacity, which one can play the game the best for me, because they're not all the same. They're not all pawns. As an example, the queen of most of our systems are usually in the fluorescent materials, the flow dentins or the margin materials or the liner materials. Why? Because they work so much more aggressively in reflecting or absorbing or manipulating light. Whereas a simple base dentin or a simple translucent material only has one ability to do something. So I'm looking for the players that can give me the most, the most impact. And to do that, I study nature to do that. So let me explain to you that whenever I put a substructure or a restoration on a tooth, what I'm creating is a shadowing effect over the actual tooth itself. And the only way to stop that is by taking away the substructure, be it zirconia, lithium, the silicate, or even metal ceramics, and allow more of the light into the tooth, or to use substructures that have more ability to manipulate and push the light in different directions. So I think where technology has helped us today, and I know this is really about ceramics, I don't want to take this into a technology world, but I want you to understand that I, where I'm feeling excited about the directions we're going, is that the technology is starting to help us to be better in these areas. Let me give you some examples. If I take a milled ceramic material, this is a pure feldspathic material, a material that I've been very high on for the last few years, and I can't tell you how what a wonderful material it is. I just finished up a, a six-unit veneer case uh, with Mark II. And if you notice the Mark II feldspathic material on the natural tooth, and after I've cleaned it and colorized it and glazed it, Look what I'm looking at from a light transmission point of view on that same nat natural tooth. That to me is wonderful, and that's one of the advantages of feldspathic ceramics. If I go into the lithium silicates or desilicates, suprenity is a silicate material, you'll notice that I've milled out my silicate material, and you look at it on a natural tooth, and you can see the light transmission optically is pretty great. And that's important to me to be able to see that. Very similar with the new Ambrium material, which is a lithium desilicate. And I find that even with some of the zirconias, especially if you get into the ST or the XTs, the really translucent zirconias, we're getting a pretty decent light transmission in and out because of the lack of opacity in the materials. So for me, I'm kind of a, a big milled feldspathic fan these days. I've been kind of pushing more in that direction. And I'll just show you one case where we milled out four little window veneers to fill the space on this patient. Um, after the ortho was done, the little brackets were removed. We didn't want to prep the teeth because they're beautiful, young, healthy teeth. So there's no reason to prep them. So I actually designed this in the digital world and then wound up milling out four basic veneers. I did a little set stain and coloration on those veneers and we'll place them in the patient's mouth. And again, these are just very minimally invasive. You can see how thin they are. We're talking two, three tenths of a millimeter. And because they're feldspathic ceramic, they really absorb my stain very well. If I'm using an accent stain or any of my staining kits, I can actually get a little bit more of an absorption because of the material, rather than sometimes on the lithium silicates or desilicates, which are a little harder. And I think uh, I fight the stains a little bit more with them. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. I just think the feldspathic is much nicer. Also with the lithium silicates today, for those of you who aren't with aren't aware, I mean the lithium silicate, sorry about that. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, I'm able to mill these materials today very quickly. Uh, it's a 20 minute, 18 minute mill, which is really nice. It's in this honey-like stage, which is wonderful. And then I'm putting it in my basic ceramic furnace. So I'm actually popping that in a basic ceramic furnace, curing it, and in its 15 to 18 minute cycle, it comes out as a solid lithium sil silicate restoration. And for me, the value on the silicates are much better, meaning I like the coloration and the values much better than some of the desilicates I've seen out there on the market. So I'm a fan of that. And then obviously, Vita does have a desilicate material. This is the new Ambria. And again, when we're working with these materials, how we design our substructures is very critical. If you've watched any of the web series, which I encourage you to do if you haven't, in modules uh, two and three, I went through substructure design and the importance of that, and then utilizing that substructure for micro layering. 
So where we can have basically monolithic from the cuspid back and micro layered anterior on lithium desilicate is kind of a nice uh, restoration or, or restorative option for us across the board. So that's the basics of all the different materials. Let's kind of dive really into the ceramics now. because That's what this webinar is really more about. For one, I want to be clear with everybody that I think most of you who know me uh, over all these years know that I've never been the kind of person who just wanted you to buy a new product. I wanted you to be educated and learn and really understand what you're using. And, and unfortunately for me, I'm at a point in career where I have the luxury of working wherever I want or for whoever I want. And to be honest with you, one of the reasons I, I chose Vita as a partner a few years back was because I was looking for a company that believed in education as much as I did and wanted to be partners for success as much as I wanted to be for all the people I'm teaching. And I think it's really important for us because look, you can all go out today and buy a million different ceramic systems. And each of them have pros and cons to them. There is none that are perfect, and there are none that are completely bad for you to use either. But in truth, what separates the difference? Well, one, ease of use, obviously. But more importantly is how can that company or the partners that you work with provide you the educational opportunities for you to be better, to grow, to educate your lab, and to move yourself forward? And for me, that's where I kind of found my partnership these last few years is really understanding that I want to work with companies who want to support the laboratories that I work with. And what I want for you as the laboratories that I'm working with is I want you to be NEO. Now, what is NEO? Well, for those of you who have seen me before, know that I'm, uh, I'm a fan of the old, I'm showing my age, the Matrix movie. And in the Matrix movie, Neo, who was the main character. Why I think this is important for you is, what do I want you to be that? Because without sounding cocky, I feel like I'm Neo today. I feel like I have the ability to look through materials and figure out how to work through them in almost a slow motion process. And I think you get my point here is that what do I want you to be? I want you to be the one. I want your a ceramist out there our designers, the laboratories that I'm working with and teaching, I want you to be able to look at your materials like Neo. And what does Neo do? He sees things in a bigger version. He sees it almost in slow motion. It's kind of funny, you know, I've done so many courses around the world these last few years, and sometimes I'll be in another country and they'll say, oh, you know, we're glad you came, but we only like this ceramic, so can you show us how to use it? And I'll be like, yeah, sure, no problem. Why can I do that? because I understand the concept. I understand the basics of how material works. And that's what I want you to be able to do. I want you to really understand. So whatever kit you use, obviously I want to help you. For me, I've stayed more in the Vita family these last few years, and I hopefully plan on staying there for a long time. And, and I've worked my way through VM13 and VM9 and VM11, and now I'm working my way through a new system called Vita Lumex. And I'm going to break that down for you a little bit more. Remember, the goal of this is that the ceramics were built to work in the 1.2 and the 1.5 range. How that works with the light is different. When I'm working in 1.2 to 1.5 and I have a tooth behind it or a substructure behind it, the light reflective ability, optical ability, refracting ability is different than when I'm working in an area that has nothing behind it. That means it changes the property of the ceramics. And I have to be much more in tune with how to work through the opacities of the materials 
and the translucencies of the materials. And when I'm doing that, especially on veneer type cases, this is one of my first Lumex cases, by the way, when I'm, when I'm working through this with veneers, a very thin amount, this was a no prep veneer, by the way, so the tooth wasn't even prepped and I had to work in two tenths of a millimeter facially and then add only about a millimeter of incisal and try to make that work. And to do that, I really have to have a really good understanding of the materials. So as I explained to you before, the materials work based on the three premises, either opacity from underneath, which is either opaque or liner material or substructure material or prep shade. I should, I should add that in, I'm sorry into dentin, which is usually about eight tenths to a millimeter thick, into enamel, which is usually 1.2 to 0.5 tenths of a millimeter thick. And again, when we put those things all together, your job is to understand the opacity of these materials. So opaque, I would tell you, is usually about 100% opacified. That means that no light, because of the amount of opacity, will actually go through that opaque at any thickness past two, three tenths of a millimeter. Yet dentin at eight tenths of a millimeter, you're gonna notice that a decent amount of light actually passes through that dentin, which is what you need to be aware of when you're thinking about when you use your dentin and how much you use it, or do I need to go to something more like an opacious dentin? And if here, all the way to the right of your screen, you're gonna notice I also have an opacious dentin material there, but I only have it at two tenths of a millimeter. And I wanted you to see that at two tenths of a millimeter, that this opacious dentin is almost translucent. I mean, realistically, if I'm using opacious dentin, because I think I have to fill more of the space, well, then maybe two tenths of a millimeter is not going to cut it for me, unless I use an opacious dentin that maybe has more fluorescence to it, or a flow dentin like we have in the new kits, or maybe I modify the dentin with some sort of a, an accent stain or something with a little more fluorescence or chroma to it, where I can still keep it at two tenths of a millimeter, but get more light reflection or more opacity out of it. So that understanding for me is very important because that's how I think through my cases. When I'm looking at the space to fill, I'm thinking, do I need opacity? Do I need translucency? Do I need some more internal fluorescence to make this refract and re refract similar to what nature would do? I know at just eight tenths of a millimeter, a lot of light is going to pass through my average dentin material. And that's not going to be enough for me to really get the understanding that I want. So that's one part of the challenge. The next part of the challenge is how you fire your restorations. So now that we're starting to get a little bit of an understanding of the opacity of the material and how important it is, I'm going to tell you how you fire the restoration is just as important. And what do I mean by that? I think if I gave you the options of, fire, of driving this car or driving this car, I'm pretty sure I know which one you'd pick. At least I know which one I would pick. And I would be honest and tell you that the difference in this car isn't just the aesthetic, it's also the engine. It's also how it performs around the turns and how the engine revs and how fast it can go and how it handles during stops as compared to the engine in this car. And even from a... Um, a scientific point of view, I can tell you there's a lot more that goes into the design of this than that goes into this. Well, why do I tell you that? Because it's very similar to your furnaces. I think when, I, when I'm in laboratories and I have people asking me to teach them how to make more depth and more of this, and then I watch them put their ceramic into this automobile or a furnace that's in the same ballpark, I say, you know, you're not getting it because the importance of that firing is very critical to how the ceramic looks at the end. So very quick explanation I'll give you, and, and I wanna be clear, this is actually funny kind of a story, but it's true. When I first went out to Germany to, to talk to Vider and decide if I was gonna work with them and they wanted to work with me, one of the first things I said to the owner was, I'm a Dekima guy. I really only use Dekima furnaces. I spend time in their factory and I can tell you that the temperature is accurate to about three degrees. That means at any point during my firing cycle, my temperature, if it's supposed to be 900, it's only gonna be 897 or 903. It's always gonna stay in that range. And I need that accuracy. And one of the scientists there kind of looked at me and laughed and he said, come see me later. And I said, okay, sure. Well, long story short, most of the lower end cars or lower end furnaces that you use, 
tend to have what we call a 20 degree swing. What does that mean? At a 900 degree cycle, you're gonna notice that if you really were able to monitor it, you could go down to as much as 880 or 920. And that's a huge difference in the maturity and the clarity and the functionality of the edges of your ceramic. So why did I switch to the 6000s? Not because I'm just wanted to use the from the one company. It was because when I tested them, they were accurate to two and a half degrees. And they also took up less of a footprint in my labs where I had one huge furnace. I can now have two nice furnaces. And that was an advantage to me. So accuracy of the firing is very, very critical for us. And where is it most critical? In these areas, right? The single central world, and we're trying to match one tooth. Look at the coloration of the gingival tissue here. Look at the natural tooth next to it. Look how little space we have to work. That was a feather edge prep, which I would never recommend for aesthetics, by the way. And you can see as I start to slide the tooth into the patient's mouth, how uh, it worked for me. By the way, I'm going to get into how I manage that gingival in a little bit, but I wanted to kind of tell you that it was very little space to actually work in for this particular tooth. And as I slide that in, you'll notice that the gingival hopefully maintains the same coloration. I'm not creating any shadowing. And you can notice that as I put it in the mouth, this is not cemented yet, but look at the pink on both sides of the restoration as compared to the pink on both sides of the natural teeth. So this crown will get cemented. I didn't do it that day, but while the patient was here, I just took two fo a few photographs just to show you the optics and how this actually worked. And then I took a photograph of it under polarized, because polarized to me, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is basically uh, a system that I could put on my camera that flattens out the look of the photograph and allows me to see a lot more depth in this. And this is really fabulous because it kind of helps me to determine if I built the tooth in the right format, which in this case, it looks like I did. So it was actually uh, got a little lucky on a single central. Sometimes we get a little bit of luck on them. Okay, the other challenge is when I'm building materials, because maybe I'm using three powders or 30 powders, whatever your number is, I want to make sure that when I put a powder in a spot and I put another powder next to it, that those powders don't blend together and become one. So what, I'm, what am I really saying is I want stability in my modeling of my material. I want to be able, and I get it, some of you might only use four powders when you build or three powders when you build. Not a problem. I don't care if you use three or you use 30. But what I do care about is when you put a color or a powder in a spot and I put another powder next to it and another one next to it, what I don't want them to do is become one. Because if they become one, it becomes what we call complex gray. What I really want them to be able to do is sit tightly next to the powder I put it to, but not just mold into one watery mess. And this is where the stability that you work with with your powder system really comes in handy for you. Now, from a manufacturer point of view, this is what manufacturers tell you. And I'm gonna say, throw this out because this doesn't really mean anything for you. They're all gonna tell you our ceramics more reliable, it's more stable, it shrinks a little less, it's more this, it's more that. Yeah, okay, all ceramics have some of those abilities to do some of those things, this is kind of true. But the real test is to fire the ceramics yourself and see what they can and can't do. So let me give you an example of that. I took some of the new Lumex material and I ran it through a ton of tests. And one of the tests I ran it through, as you can see here, I actually added a little tiny dot of extra ceramics sticking out of the, of, of the buildup. And I did that on purpose. And I took this buildup, this wash buildup, and I put it in the oven at 20 degrees higher than the manufacturer recommended. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to see what happened to the stability of the material. Would that roll away and become nothing? And you can see it's got a little roll to it. Remember, this is 20 degrees higher than the actual ceramic is supposed to be able to be fired. Why is that critical? Because that's what tells me that I have a, a good stable material that is not going to be changing and, and, and being manipulated every time I fire, especially if my oven is off a little bit because every oven has a little swing. But again, my job is to manage that swing to be as minimal as possible. So that's how I test. The other thing I test when I look at ceramic systems, and for those of you who are taking courses with me, you're probably very aware that if you were in my lab and you opened my ceramic drawers, you'll notice that all, or are used to anyway, most all my ceramic bottles, sorry, most all my ceramic bottles 
have little color pigment wheels that I've made on them. And the reason I did that was because I don't want to just think that this bottle is A1 or this bottle is blue translucent or this bottle has some amber color to it. What I really wanted to do was every time I opened my drawer, I wanted to see all those little dots of color. And I want that because when I'm looking at a case, a real patient, and I'm looking at the colors of the teeth, I want to be able to say, yeah, I see this. And then I look in my drawer and say, ah, yes, that's kind of the color I'm looking for. So I've always done this for every ceramic that I've used. I've made these little tabs and I've glued them to the tops of the bottles. But I gotta be honest with you, when I started working with the new Lumex material, I started doing the same thing out of repetition. And about halfway through and a week through of making all these little tabs, I'm like, why am I doing this? They've already done that for me. It's pretty cool actually, because if you notice every bottle actually has the coloration of what is in the bottle. So even though I've acquired this tab, I actually already can see that every time I open my draw. So if I'm going with something Arctic white, look at the color, it's a very white. If I'm going with a smoky white, you can see it's translucent, but I see a whitish red, a uh, whitish translucency to it. If I'm looking at one of my favorite powders, this is called Water Drop, look at the coloration of it. And this is really important for me because I want you as ceramics to really have a better understanding of the colors that you have to work with, not just use the same things over and over again. And one of the things I was fairly adamant about with the Vita company was, let's not make our system sound blah, because they're not. Each of these colors have an important process to them. So a water drop should have that bluish water droppy effect, where the Arctic white should have that cold and white push of value to it. And each of the colors that we kind of went through we colorize them to really fit to what we see in nature, what we see in dentistry today. The other thing that I think they did, which was really smart, and, and I, I'm happy to share this with you, is they also simplified the system. So not only do you get the coloration like you see here on the top of the bottle that kind of gives you what is inside that bottle, but you also notice the band on the outside of the bottle. And that band kind of helps to put this into categories. Right, so if I'm looking at my dented materials, I'm going to be more in that orangey shade. If I'm looking at modifiers, it's more that reddish brown. If it's chroma intense, I'm getting even more of the redness in there, or the mammalons are kind of purpley, and the margins get into a real lavendery purple. And what does this help us to do is, again, every time I'm looking at a color on the top of my bottles and my drawer, it's giving me the thought process of what I'm looking for in the colorations, which I think is really important for us. For those of you who are VM9 users, users, I've gotten a lot of phone calls on this in the last uh, few months, even during the COVID process. People ask me, well, what's different about it? Well, what's really different about it is the opacity. And let me explain to you where that, that's better for us in some ways. One of my knocks, although I still use VM9, I still think it's a great powder, but it was a much more translucent powder. And it took me a while to understand how to use the effect chromas and some of the more opacified materials in the kit that, by the way, were not technically opacious dentin, right? They were, it was a different kit. And although I think it's a fabulous kit and I still use it, it was, a, let's say, aggressive to figure out a whole new system and try to teach it to people. And I know when I was teaching a lot of courses, people struggled with, well, I don't understand. I need opacious dentin. You don't have that. And I'd say, okay, well, the effect chroma one or two or three is similar to the opacious dentin, but not exactly. And then we'd have to kind of explain that process. So one of the things we did with the new Lumex material was we kind of went backwards. We improved the material, but we also went backwards in the sense of simplifying opaque dentin, um, dentin modifiers, margin materials, line, not liners, I'm sorry, uh, enamel, more translucent. We kind of simplify it to what people knew best. So let me give you an example. The base dented in the VM9 kind of fell in this area of the chart. And what this chart is, this area right here would be 100% opacified, and this area would be 100% translucency. So your base dented actually fell more towards the translucent side, which is fairly normal in a lot of dentins. Your base dentins are usually anywhere from 30 to 40% opacified, which should be shocking to some of you because you should be thinking, wow, I would have thought they were a lot more opacified than that. They're not. So 
this is where the importance of understanding how to use opacious materials become more of a factor for us. You'll notice that the new opacious dentin material in the Lumex is way more opacified than the base dentins in the VM9 kit, yet the dentin of the new Lumex material tends to fall in the middle, a little closer to the base dentin, but somewhat in the middle between the base dentin and the transpot dentin in the VM9 kit or the VM13 kit. And why is this important? Again, for your understanding of how to fill space and what opacity I need when I'm filling the space. So if I compare the two of these a little bit more, I told you my opacious dentin is a little bit more towards the opacity side. Also, one of my knocks with the, the VM materials, I think the gingivas were a little too translucent. So when I worked with any of the pink shades, that was problematic for me. Um, now in the Lumex, we've increased the opacities in the gingiva. And then also the flow dentins, which are basically dentin materials or flow intensive, they call them. They're more dentin materials, but they have a higher fluorescence to them. And because they have a higher fluorescence, that makes them appear much more opacified and allows me to use them much more similar to mammalon materials, by the way. Mammalon materials tend to be much higher in fluorescence and also have the ability to be much more opacified. So I look at those materials because those are very useful materials for me. And I think one of the real strengths with the new Lumex material is this, it's one system. And what do I mean by one system? I can use it on milled blocks. I can use it on lithium to silicate. I can use it over zirconia materials, or I could use it feldspathically. I can use it in many different areas. So let me be clear with that. I can use it on lithium to silicate. I can use it on zirconia. I can use it feldspathically. It means I have a lot of uses for that one material now. And for me, if again, if you come in my lab, I have five different drawers of ceramic that I'm slowly getting rid of and having one or two drawers of ceramic now where I could use them more across the board, which is really nice for me. And again, the real key to this is going to be education. You need to be educated. I need to be educated. We constantly need that, that new thought process of how we can utilize what we have in our systems. So let me give you a little example of some of the opacious dentin materials. And this is um how I like to explain some of the light transmission. For one, most of you who are using zirconia materials today are using what we call a wash bake. And the concept of a wash bake, I think if I asked you all the different questions, you'd all give me different answers. But the basic premise is, well, I use it for bond. I use it to create fluorescence. I use it because I want to get a little wash of a color on my coping. And all of them are slightly right. But the truth of it is, I'm going to say that our wash bakes are a wasteful time. Let me explain to you what I mean. One, fine grain. Most of the time, you're going to get the best bond between the ceramic and the core anyway. That extra little temperature of firing isn't giving you that much differential. So right away, that kind of throws out it just for the bond. If I'm using it for color, well, putting a wash on very, very thin doesn't give you the most intense color. So you kind of lost that argument a little bit too. So what I've done is I've switched that concept around. What I do with a lot of my cases is one, I'm ceramic margin guy. So I really want to use ceramic margin materials most of the time. And I know when I say that probably 70% of you, 70% of you shut down and go, oh, I don't want to start building ceramic margins. Those are a pain in the neck. No, they're not. They're actually very simple. And I can teach you how to do that very simply. But even if you don't want to use a ceramic margin, that's okay. I still want you to use a fluorescent material, either a margin material or a flow intensive material or stain materials that are much more fluorescent and color intensive to actually create a better substructure in my wash bake. So let me explain to you what I mean. Just like I showed you before, I want to create more chroma cervically which means I'm gonna use materials that are higher in chroma and maybe even higher in fluorescence. I wanna create value in the middle third. So I might wanna use a material that's higher in opacity and higher in value. And then as I get towards the incisal edge, especially in today's restorative world, where a lot of us are working on zirconia backed restoration and not having as much facial room to learn to work in, I need to create translucency and depth in those rooms. And I'm going to do that with my first wash bake. 
So this would be what I call a first wash bake. And I want you to notice that in my wash bake, I'm filling space. In your wash bake, you're kind of just painting something on the coping and it's not helping you as much as you think. I want to utilize that space better. Why? Because if I'm working in 1.2 or 1.5, I want to create the best light optics in that material. And for me, that's going to be fluorescence in either flow intensive margin materials, even some liner materials, or some staining materials if I don't have true room to work in. So let me give you another example. That's fluorescence. Now let's put that to the side and look at opacity. Another example that I'm going to give you is the doctor has asked you to make two, two restorations, eight and nine, and he, he or she asked for them as A1 restorations. Okay, A1 sounds great. I take the A1 powder, I take the enamel, the light that goes with that, I put those two together, and I make an A1 restoration. In theory, fine. But in truth, you won't have a perfect A1 unless... The coloration of the prep shade is perfect or the substructure is perfect. The space that you used was exactly eight tenths to a millimeter thick and the enamel was exactly 1.2 to 0.5. And if you have those perfect, you'll get a pretty close A1. Will it look amazing? No, it'll look like a classic A1 shade guide. And if that's what you want the work to look like, okay. For me, it's not acceptable. I want more. I want it to look like nature. I want it to look better. So here's what I'm gonna to do to build an A1. And for those of you who are two or three powder builders, don't get confused. I'm gonna add in a few more powders, but I'm only gonna add in either flow intensive materials or opacity materials. In this case, I'm gonna use the example with opacious dentins and watch what I do. So my first part of the build up for my A1 crown is gonna be some A4 opacious dentin. Yes, A1 crown, A4 opacious dentin. And I'm gonna use that into proximally and cervically. Why? Because I wanna increase the chroma in those areas and I don't wanna use a lot of thickness to do that. The next powder I'm gonna use is a B1 opacious dentin. I know I said A1, I'm confusing you guys, right? But why am I gonna use that? Because I wanna raise the value in these areas and up and down the line angle so I have a little bit more bounce of light. And then for those of you who know me, I'm kind of anti the C and D shades. I don't believe they exist. I hardly ever use them, but I do use them now and then to cheat the optics of light. Meaning that I wanted to extend this coping a little tiny bit. I didn't want it to be high value or high chroma. So I dipped into a C shade. Why? Because I want to keep the value down, but I wanted the opacity of the, AU, of the opa uh, opaque dented material. And then just for the fun of it, I'm gonna throw in a little opacious dentin A2, and that's just to give me a little bit of warmth. Now remember, A1 is my goal. So far I've used four opacious dentins. That might be four more powders than you're used to using. No problem, this is your aligner. This is your new aligner. And I want you to see the difference of what's gonna happen here. I'm now gonna take one dentin material. So here's my four basic um, opacious dentin materials. And on the coping number nine, I'm not gonna put anything on it. I'm gonna leave just my A1 looking coping here. And now I'm gonna take one dented material, A1, and I'm gonna start building that up. And I'm gonna build that on both restorations. So remember the eight has four opacious dentins under it, the nine has nothing under it except the coping. And I'm gonna build the whole restoration with A1 dentin. I'm going to build the enamel with just one enamel, enamel light. So it's a two powder buildup besides what I did in my wash bake. I'll finalize those, do a little correction bake. And I want you to look at the two of those next to each other. Remember, the goal was to build an A1 restoration. On tooth number nine, I used a millimeter of A1 and a half millimeter of my light enamel. But on tooth number eight, I used some opacious materials underneath and then a little less of my dentin and my enamel. And I want you to notice right away that hope you can see the difference in the value of these two teeth. You should notice that the A1 on the uh, right of your screen or the number nine actually looks a little lower in value. And to prove that to you, let me put a shade guide next to it. This is actually an A2 shade guide. Notice the difference between what I'm seeing here value-wise 
I'm much more in the A2 family than I am in the A1 family. Although if I come here and put it next to my opacious buildup, look at how much better the value is. I'm back in the A1 family. So I'm ma managing value through the optics of the opacity or the fluorescence. This was one of the first, first cases I did with the Lumex material. And again, I wanna show you how I manage the space. So look at the two centrals, young girl, she was 14. She broke her two front teeth. We don't have to do anything to those teeth. Matter of fact, we did nothing. I asked the doctor just to pat cord and give me an impression. And that's exactly what the doctor did. And now I'm gonna dive into my new material, refractory dyes. I'll go through these kind of quick. And I'm gonna start by filling this space with an intensive fluorescent type material. Something that I know is highly fluorescent, yet I could use very thin to give me the opacity I need. Then I'm gonna go over that maybe with an ivory modifier or something that's a little still opacified, but not as fluorescent as my flow intensive material. And again, it was very thin at this moment. And then after that, it gets kind of simple. I'm gonna just go straight into my dented materials. I used a little A2 dentin. I used my favorite water drop, and she didn't really have much of a mammal on, so I just kind of covered that with some enamels. And there was my final two veneers that I, I finished up for. And you can see these seat right over the patient's natural teeth, and we're gonna look at them on their own. So you can see where the opacity is, where the translucency is, and where the translucency is, it's gonna bond to the natural tooth. This way I, I'm not, I don't need the opacity to be everywhere. I just needed it to be in some areas to create the depth and the right re light reflection that I need. And when the doctor bonded these in, this is Dr. Mike here on Staten Island. Um, you notice he's just gonna polish those little areas away and we'll get a pretty great light transmission just like she had in the natural teeth. And those will be fine. I didn't need 8 billion megapascals to make that work. I just needed an optical understanding. Okay, I'm going to try to move to this a little quicker now. So that was working at it as a feldspathic. I can also put this material on zirconium material. And I won't give you all the details again just for time here. We prepped out the case. It's going to be bridge work. So I'm going to make this in two separate bridges. And you'll notice that I've designed that in the Amon Gearbox system, which is what I use for my designing. This is a lingual zirconia. So I'm really just layering on the facial at this point. And again, I went through the exact same things that I just talked about. I used a margin material cervically and created my canvas with some more blue around my lingual wall of zirconia. And then I micro layered my material in a very white bright, which is what the patient wanted. And you can see here on insert that she looks pretty comfortable and happy. The tissue is still healing a little bit, but it looks like it's gonna be fine. And yes, those are two bridges that are in the patient's mouth, even though they hopefully look somewhat singular at this point, and that was over zirconia materials. Also, I can use this same Lumex material over with the silicate, as I said to you before. And again, I won't go through all the details of every case, because I think this is a piece manager. I'm really just today talking about the material. So you'll notice that I, I layered facially, again, zirconia lingual, uh, lithium silicate lingual, micro layered facial, and a before and after of our patient over lithium desilicate materials. Okay, same process over and over again. And I'll show you the last case. I think we're just about on time here. I'll show you our last case back to a feldspathic case. I still do a lot of feldspathic, but I also do lithium silicates and desilicates. I'm also milling some of my veneers now. And I still think layering a veneer is kind of the ultimate for me. And I would argue is the ultimate for your business protocol, because if you have that ability to deliver the highest end restoration, then you have the ability to charge the most for that restoration. And I think that's where understanding the layering concept really works best for us. So again, I won't walk you through all the case complexities, because that's probably just for other days and other lectures. But at this moment, we're gonna take all our base shades, we're gonna provisionalize the patient. She came in because of an aesthetic uh, unhappiness with what she had. She wanted to close the spaces and manage the colorations a little bit more. Again, I went back to a refractory veneer case. So this is my alveola cast that I used for almost all my refractory veneer cases. By the way, one of the beauties that I should tell you of um, milling some of these feldspathic veneers, I know it sounds crazy for those guys who know me and think, your feldspathic veneer guy, I'm loving milling. Now listen, it's not for every case. I gotta be honest with you. That's your job 
or my job to help you with to know what cases it's right for or what cases it's not right for. But in certain cases, when it is right, that ability to move to mill a feldspathic veneer and still have that pure ceramic restoration, I think is fabulous. This particular case, I needed to do a lot more, and because of the spacing, it wasn't a great case for a milled veneer. So uh, also the prep shades didn't allow for me to have a lot of space to work in. So I started this case off very similar to all the rest. I went with my flow dentin materials or my flow intensive to increase the value and extend the tip of the incisal edge of the restorations. And that was the flow Arctic white flow intensive, maybe a little V1 or patient dentin in some areas. And then I started with my A2 dentin around the cervical. I shift that to an A1 dentin in the middle. And to be honest with you, I didn't really use an A1 dentin, even though I'm saying that. I actually used uh, an OM2. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because the OM2 wasn't in the kit at the time. I happen to have a lot of the powders before most people get them. So I was using an OM2 to boost that value more than the A1. But I could have used a B1 or something higher in value to push that value up there a little bit. And then I'm going to break into my mammalon materials and my, my water drop around the incisal edges, very similar to all the canvases that I use over and over again. I used one or two different mammalon materials, and sometimes I might even use one or two of the intensive materials. And what is the goal of that? To make them opacified or fluorescent enough to manipulate the light around my water drop material. I'm zooming in on this because I really want you to see all those little details of how the light is working to make that happen. And then I'm going to cover that with some enamels and I'm going to use a different group of enamels. I might use two, three different enamels. Sometimes I want a whiter enamel. Sometimes I want a little more translucency. That's really dependent on what you're looking for in the final result. I'll finish up the restorations and we'll place those intraoral. Now, what I'd like you to see here is as we're placing them intraoral, and by the way, this is only on insertion. I never got after photos of this patient, but look how nice. Look at the coloration of the tissue on its own, and look at the coloration of the tissue as we slide that veneer up in there. I can't tell you guys enough that you really want to improve the aesthetics in your laboratory. I could teach you how to put more blues and more chromas and more value. That's easy but also you have to understand how to manage the paint and the space, because that's what really starts to separate your restorations from the lab that's just selling the monolithic, quick, fast, 900 megapascal restoration. So I want you to have the ability to really see what I call the face, the white, and the paint. That's a big part of our restorations today. So here she is on insertion. You can see the patient's still numb, and I'm sure we'll get some nice fill in here. Um, on the papillas as she heals up a little bit more. Um, I put this in right before Chicago this year, and then obviously uh, we shut down for COVID, so I haven't got to get any final finals on her after that. But you can see she's a happy camper, even nice and numb. I'll also recommend uh, for a few of you, if you're interested, or your doctors, I just finished up a book with a bunch of other authors that is strictly on veneers. I wrote one of the chapters, and one or two of my doctors wrote others, and Gareep Carell and Ryan Lesage all wrote beautiful chapters in there. So if you want to get a chance, you can look for that book or, or maybe recommend it to some of your doctors. So with that said, um, I'll say thank you to kind of spending some time with me. I have nowhere to go. If you have questions and you want to um, ask, I'll be glad to answer anything I can for you. And uh, I'm in the lab, so if you want a little tour of the lab, I'll give you that too while we're here. But uh, Thank you guys for, for coming to spend some time with me today. And I hope, I hope you got some insight into ceramic materials. All right, thank you, Peter, very much. Uh, that was wonderful news and, and very helpful information on what you provided everyone. Uh, we're gonna get to some questions, but just a reminder for everyone, if your question is about CE credits, you can get a, uh, an email uh, sent to your uh, email uh, address and there'll be a link for you to click on so that you can achieve some CE credits, one hour credit. You can also revisit this uh, webinar. It has been recorded. We'll post it as soon as possible. You can uh, view that on the Vita North American uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram accounts. 
So let's uh, get some uh, questions uh, through. We have one. Just, just so you know, if like, you have any questions about getting a haircut, tell them we're not answering that question. <laughs> I need one. <laughs> I, I, so do I, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is asking, how do you keep stability when uh, condensing? Uh, or are you condensing on that material? So, so the answer is no, I'm not condensing. And, and, and I don't want to say, Elizabeth, you might be showing our age, because I grew up in the condensing <laughs> world too. Um, the concept of condensing really had a lot more to do with the particle size of ceramic, was getting them closer together. Today, we're in a much finer grain ceramic world, and those finer grains really join well on their own. By the way, if, that's one of the reasons that we talk about the material shrinkage, right? when you have smaller particle sizes of sand that are closer together to start with, it's harder for them to shrink more than they are. When you have chunkier ceramics and bigger blocks and bigger pieces of sand, and you put them together and you fire them, that's where you get a lot more shrinkage out of the material. So I do not condense. And just so you know, I build extremely wet. I, I, I am a very wet, wet builder. I like everything wet. At the same time, I have a lot of control because of the fact that I, I'm using a small brush and I'm, I'm really controlling my placements and I don't want to condense them because the minute I start condensing them, I'm going to start creating a complex gray out of my material. All right, uh, William, I'll paraphrase his question. Uh, do you use uh, paste or powder glaze? And do you have any issue with uh, the glaze peeling away uh, over Lumex? So um, I use a little of both, to be honest with you. Um, I don't want to go into a long diatrop here of, of glaze materials, but I'm going to tell you that the concept of these paste fluorescent gray glaze materials really came about because of monolithic materials. If you understand surface luster of a tooth, you understand that the only time I really, really want to use the, these, these fluorescent glaze paste is on monolithics. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean I don't use them on my ceramics, but after I use them, which is more as a sealant or a filler of any micro porosity I miss, I'm rubber wheeling that and polishing it. And the simple answer is no, I haven't seen any peeling on them, but I, I do treat differently. I'm not looking for the shiny, shiny marble. I'm looking for a surface that I create at the end. And that's usually after glazing by polishing. All right. Uh, Devin has a question on the uh, Lumex. Have you used it on a refractory material and for veneers? And if so, what's the uh, type of refractory do you use? So the answer is, of course, all the, those two cases I showed you are both refractory. I'm a big refractory guy, old school. I'm kicking it old school. Um, the refractory that I'd say universally works best with all the ceramics that I've worked with, or most of them, is from uh, GC, and it's the Orbit Vest. Orbit Vest GC is kind of our standard. We use that on almost every ceramic we've tested over the years, and I'm going to tell you that it works on about 90% of the ceramics out there today. All right, then Dylan has a question. What model and die system do you use for refractory? So we're using what we call an alveolar model. It's a, uh, a variation or an improvement on the, the original Geller cast. It's a little complicated. I'm pretty sure that, uh, I don't remember which module it is, Jim. It might be module four in the series that I actually had a bunch of slides and I broke down and showed you how we make the model. I'll be honest to tell you it's a complex model, but once you use them on refractory, you're gonna to start to say, wow, this is really worth having because it gives you a whole different development of understanding emergence profile, but it is a complex model to make. Yeah, and, and just a reminder for everyone, all those recordings, including what just Peter had mentioned, his uh, six-week series that covers a, a vast uh, number of topics uh, can, can be found on the Vita North American uh, website, as well as the Vita North America YouTube channel, the Facebook channel, Twitter, and Instagram through, um, through Vita North America. Yeah, if you guys watch that whole series, I would suggest it's six hours of your life. I know it's a lot right now, but um, especially since we're all getting back in a groove. But I think it's a good series. I'm, I'm proud of the series. Like we really broke everything down one, one session at a time. I don't know if it'll be on this channel forever, so get out there and watch it while you can. 
Yeah, it was an excellent series. So, uh, like Peter, I concur. Um, go to the site, look at them. Uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of detail, a lot of uh, technicians, uh, uh, technical explanation on, on many subjects. Uh, Peter, is it? Uh, have you used any platinum foil with uh, with your technique? Say, say that again. Do I use platinum foil? Yeah, for your veneers, have you used the platinum foil technique? So I have to be very honest with tell you, I suck at platinum foil. I'm really not that good at it. I've worked with a lot of great friends of mine who are great at it, and they've shown me it's not my strength. Um, do we do them sometimes? Yes, of course we do. Certain cases, it will, it's easier just to foil. The flaw for me with foiling, besides the fact that it's not my strength, is that you do lose some of the gingival emergence. I have to kind of carve away a little of that tissue on the cast, which is why I really stuck to the uh, the, the uh, alveolar type model. But but here's where I think I'm gonna put a plug back into like a Mark II material. I can now mill a base on a dye model and then transfer that milled felt fabric ceramic on a solid cast and then micro layer over it, just like I was able to do on refractory. So again, there's a lot of advantages of some of the technology that we're using today. And speaking of uh, Mark II, uh, Warren had a question about, and you you answered it, but um, uh, just to have his question out on the table. Uh, on a Mark II veneer, do you only stain or do you micro build uh, with the Lumex as well? I do both. And I gotta be honest with you, again, for those of you who know me, the, the, you, I was the guy who was anti staining glaze veneers. And by the way, I still kind of feel that way with lithium silicates and desilicates, right? But not felt fabric. If I can make a two tenths of a millimeter felt fabric, what would I layer on? It's only two tenths of a millimeter to start with. So staining glaze is fine and then polished. But if I have a normal space veneer and I have good supporting from the prep itself, then I can mill this out at two, three tenths of a millimeter, which is now my base tinted material, and then build all the same effects and mammals and translucency. And by the way, I can even do some of that in my design, right? I can actually make my mammalons come out a little bit more off of that milled material, and then I can stain that, set stain that, and then just put enamels over that. And boy, night and day difference between that and what I would call a, a stain lithium silicate veneer. Uh, Roger has a follow-up about your horse and shoulder margin technique. Uh, is it possible for you to quickly go through that again? Um, sure. So I don't know if I have it in this lecture per se, but let me see if I, I'll just pull up one of the slides. So Roger, I mean, here's the simplicity of it for me. So I'm just going to pop this up on the screen for a second. So. Look, the concept of understanding light dynamics is really about getting light in and out of the tooth as much as it is about supporting the gingival tissue. PFM ceramic, if I still, and I still do a lot of PFM, I'm going to tell you that all my PFM in my laboratory is 360 degrees ceramic margin. Why? Because I don't want metal shadowing the tooth. What I found over the years, especially when I first started working with zirconia, is even the more translucent zirconias still create a shadow because they're optically not the greatest material for light reflection. So if I look back at some of my zirconia cases that I didn't put ceramic margins on, I don't think they look as natural as the ones that I did. Now, if I'm doing a, a, a zirconia lingual, then all I'm gonna do is cut back the facial aspect like I'm showing here. And now I'm either gonna use my margin material or I could even use a liner material. And here's where it's kind of cool for us, Roger. I could use the liner materials from the VM9 kit, which fire much higher, and I could actually build up my whole marginal material, very highly fluorescent, and I could use a few different ones of them, like I'm showing here, to do all the work that I want to do. And by the way, this is not a four-hour buildup. This is a wash bake buildup, right? I, I float around my margin. I vibrate it, I hit it with a hair dryer, and then I put on the rest of those little materials. I remove it and put it in on my cycle of either my margin material or my liner material. When that comes out, this is what you see. And now when you go to build your dentins and your other materials, you've already taken up some of the space 
and now your dentin layer is, is a much more of a micro build. So you're putting a little bit more in the beginning, but getting a much better, better result at the end because of it. All right. So Alan has a, um, a question as well. So it may be, uh, let me kind of paraphrase it as well. How do you do the cutback on a veneer or an anterior crown to allow space for over layering on the milled restoration? Maybe do you, do you do the design, cut it back into design, or do you use an instrument to cut it after it's milled? Um, you yeah, so I, I got your question. The answer is both. Um, depending on how much space I have in the design, you know, here's one of the amazing things, and and God, Jim, I hate sounding like such a homer sometimes. You're but cut I back. Uh, yeah, so I, I, Jen does most of the designs here, and by the way, she gives me veneers, feldspathic veneers at a Mark II, that are sometimes two tenths of a millimeter. Let me be clear, two tenths of a millimeter. I'm like, Jen, make it thicker. That's too thin for me, right? That means we're milling them at two tenths of a millimeter, cutting them off the block, and just taking away the little screw button, and I got enough space to do whatever I want. But if I have more room, I can actually build some of the mammalon structures out, create more of a base in the cervical. And I don't mind doing that with the feldspathic. Why? Because it's feldspathic. It's a nicer material to work through. If for some reason we were just copying a scan and we were in a rush and I copied a scan that had you know, full form, I could also cut it back freely by hand. Why? Because it's ceramic. It's feldspathic. I'm not grinding on lithium silicate or desilicate, so it's a much easier process for me. But the simple answer is both. Sometimes we cut it back in design. Sometimes we might cut a little back at the end. All right. And then um, just a little housekeeping question. Um, how can Some of you are asking, how can you try the Lumex AC, uh, have an intro kit, etc.? Uh, those of you that are interested, please contact uh, Vita North America, and we will put you in touch with your uh, local representative and uh, help you out there. Um, we also have a question from Austin. Um, where is the best place to order your book from? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think it's on Amazon. If I'm not, it's not just my book. There's a bunch of people. I think Amazon has it, if I'm not mistaken. All right, and then um, Vasily is asking um, if do you happen to have in your slide deck uh, any diagram with the fluores fluorescence different powders? Say that again. Uh, do you have in your slide deck a uh, a picture of the different Lumex AC portions that show the difference in fluorescence, or do you have a diagram or I, I don't have one in this lecture. Yeah. I definitely have one. I'd have to look for it. I'm not sure exactly where it is. As I'm walking around, I'll give you a little lap tour while we're here. Um, I know I definitely have one, but I'm sure I can, if you email me, I'll, I'll pull out the slides and give them to you. All right. So, uh, nice, nice laboratory. You got a lot of plaques on the wall there as well. <laughs> yeah, that's my desk over there. So I'm getting a little laboratory tour for everybody. It's weird because I'm not normally teaching when I'm in the lab, so it's kind of nice to invite some people in. Yeah, I'll bring some people nurse. in. Nice. I'm going to so bring you upstairs, and upstairs is our digital department and also uh, the view of the lab from upstairs. And here is our a little messy up here right now, but basically all our digital equipment. Go ahead, you have another question? I'm sorry. No, no, uh, actually that, that ends the uh, uh, the questions, unless someone has a last minute question they want to throw out, but it looks like uh, that sums it up. So again, Peter, thank you very much for presenting all that useful information for many of us to do um, laboratory work and to strive to become better. Greatly appreciate it. And for the for the one question that I don't think I answered well, please email me, right? So my email is on the last slide there, I think. If it's not mistaken, I'll make sure it's there. Yes, my email is here. Um, shoot me an email and I will, sorry, there it is. 
bz7 and aol.com just shoot me an email and i'll i'll pull out some i know i have a bunch of slides that'll help you so just remind me what the question is that you want to know and i'll and i'll definitely get you the information you need all right well thank you again uh those of you that have joined us uh, appreciate you visiting uh the webinar and listening to uh peter peasy uh another excellent uh webinar um, as we mentioned, you can go visit many of uh, Peter's webinars on our website, uh, on the Vita North American uh, YouTube channel, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Those of you, again, who are looking for CE, you should get a, e an email from our education department with a couple of links for you to, uh, to join and ask, uh, answer some questions. Peter, again, it was very nice to uh, spend time with you. Thank you, Jim. Look forward to seeing you in person soon. Yes, uh, hopefully so. So this will uh, conclude the uh, VITA Learning Webinar featuring Peter Peasy. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Jim.